Hello, everyone. Today, I want to continue the ongoing series I've begun on death and afterlife in the ancient Western world. We'll move on down. It seems that as time goes on, views change and emerge, which you would certainly expect throughout human history. And I want to take us down to about the first century BCE, first and second centuries. Take a look down, kind of helicopter view, uh, Greek ideas, Jewish ideas, uh, and we'll begin to see more and more changes taking place. In the last episode that I did, there is already some of these new views emerging, certainly the immortality of soul, but even resurrection of the dead in terms of the Hebrew view. Uh, Job, remember, at least uh, yearns for that, that his redeemer would live and that he would be somehow vindicated even though he died. So here we're going to see some real changes. And I, as usual, I'm going to share the slides uh, because I want to illustrate these things in that way. So I call this, uh, let me just clear my screen here. I call this emerging views of death in the Hellenistic period, Greeks, Romans, and Jews. I put at the bottom persistence and change because that's exactly what you find that is characteristic of this Hellenistic period. On the one hand, you look back and still see remnants of the old views, and then new views are also emerging. It's a fascinating period. I would say around 200 BCE on down to 200 CE, you get this full development of cultures, Jewish, Roman, and Greek, so that different kinds of ideas begin to emerge. And we'll just begin to trace the very first stages of those things today. Now, the dualistic Hellenistic view that we saw with Plato, remember Plato in the cave, and the idea that the body is a prison of the soul, and that humans are really immortal. And then you remember those golden plates, which are the first examples that we find anywhere. They're in tombs in which the departed soul goes down to the Greek Hades, the world of the dead, and it begins to say, I'm a child of earth and starry heaven, but heaven alone is my home. Such a significant shift that just becomes like a flood after a while. So Cicero, the Latin writer, writes a republic just like Plato. And in book six, he tells about a dream, whether it's fictional or not, not sure, of Scipio Africanus. Now, Scipio Africanus is the Roman general that conquers Carthage. So he's very well known in Roman history, those of you that remember the Carthage Wars. And in the dream, I just have part of what happens, uh, his son, begins to dream that he's rising up above the earth, ascending to heaven, but it is a dream. And as he gets further and further away, he gets this heavenly perspective. All the things on the earth shrink away and become smaller and smaller and smaller. And then he begins to go past the stars and into the planet areas, the different levels of heaven that people imagined in the Hellenistic world. And he encounters his dead father, the great Scipio Africanus, the general. And he asks him about all of these things. You know, you've got this heavenly life now. His father has been recipient of what we call astral immortality. In other words, he's part of that starry heaven now. And he says, uh, what is it all about, basically? And here's what his father says. His father replied, do indeed strive and see that it is not you, but your body that is mortal. For you are not the man that your human form reveals, but the soul of each man is his real self. Of course, this is masculine language, but you understand each person, not the human figure, which the eye can see. This is just Platonism again, you know, like the cave and like seeing the real self 
if you leave this physical world. Know therefore that you are a God, and then he defines it. If indeed it is a God that has life, sensation, memory, and presides just as the sovereign God rules over this universe, and just as the eternal God moves the universe, which is part perishable, so an eternal soul moves the frail body. This is an ancient argument, certainly goes back to Plato, but I think before that. It's very simple. If I move my hand, it's not my hand that's moving, it's I move my hand. But what is that I? It's clearly the God of the body, you might say, the control of the body. It's my inner self. So if the body perishes, even if I lose a limb or I lose a part of my body that's not a vital organ and I'm still alive, I'm still here. Is that not proof that we are all immortal? So the body is a prison. It can be seen very, very negatively or not so negative, but just a first stage in a higher life, almost like a birth where you go into a full life where you really belong. So this is just pure Hellenistic dualism, but it's reflected on the cosmos and the human person. That's what I want you to notice. So just as the cosmos is dual, there's the lower area that is inferior really, and the heavens are superior. You are more or less trapped in between, or if you take a more positive view, you've been assigned duty down here in the lower area, but you really belong in heaven. This notion, I'm telling you, it's just probably the most common idea in the Western world. And as I've mentioned before, I call it the idea that took over the world. Now, we'll get to science later, but right now we're talking about the Hellenistic view. So above is the divine, immortal, eternal, unchanging, imperishable. And below is the human, the mortal, the temporary, the transient, and the perishable. Very simple dualism. You understand why you would call it dualism. Now, these are very interesting, fascinating. I never get tired of uh, reading them. Richard Lattimore, Themes in Greek and Latin Epitaphs. An epitaph is what you put on your tombstone or some kind of a plaque of your grave. And remember, in this period, the Greco-Roman period, you could either cremate or bury both. And even if you cremated, your ashes would be put in an urn and you would still bury the urn and have some sort of a monument. So what is wonderful about this is it shows you the complete variety. It's like if we could do a Gallup poll of the ancient world and stop people on the streets of, say, Pompeii, and we could say, uh, hello, what do you think of uh, death? What happens when you die? Maybe you would get this kind of variety. I don't know about you, but I love visiting old cemeteries in Europe and the United States. Mainly, I've done it. And if you go to some of them that aren't too old, where the writing has faded. Uh, I used to teach at William and Mary, and you know, the College of William and Mary goes back to the 1600s. So a couple of those cemeteries right there in Colonial Williamsburg uh, do go back a few hundred years, and some of them you can still read. And usually, even if it's faded by the weather, there'll be a plaque to show you what those faded letters say. And it's always interesting to see what people say. One of the things I'll mention in a cemetery right here in North Carolina, uh, where I live, uh, not too far outside of town, Monroe, south of Charlotte. I live in Charlotte. And I remember seeing a cemetery. Don't have a picture of it handy or I'd throw it up on the screen. But it just had a typical grave, a burial, and then the tombstone with the name of the person and the dates and so forth. And then it had a kind of an oval at the top and it had a hand like this and it said, gone home. Oh man, I thought that was interesting since I studied this kind of thing. Apparently it used to be popular on tombs. I haven't seen it in modern cemeteries, but this one went back to the 19th century. So let's look at these. Among the dead, there are two companies. One moves upon the earth. The other moves in the ether 
of the choruses of the stars. I belong to the latter, for I have obtained a God for my guide. Wow. You know, it's one thing to read literary texts about what people believe, but to have a testimony from an otherwise unknown person. This particular person is a sailor at Marseille, but look what he's saying. He has obtained a God, not just to bless him in this life, which is usually what you think of for a Greek temple, to bless your crops, to make heal you, to prosper your life and guard you and protect you. He says that he has obtained a God for a guide, and he's gone up for what we call astral immortality. So that one's amazing. Now, talk about opposites, number two. By wetting my ashes with wine, you will make mud. I shall not drink when I am dead. These are all like first, second century BCE. Uh, this particular individual doesn't think much of all these new fangled views of afterlife. He basically wonders uh, what would be the point of it. And what's happening is family members are coming and they're remembering the dead. And often they would pour out a bit of wine over the, the grave. You know, they would have a meal themselves, a kind of a meal in the cemetery. I know it sounds strange to a lot of modern people today. I think it's still done in Europe, though, in places and maybe even in other countries. Uh, like the United States where I live, I'm not sure. So what's he saying? He's saying, you know, you're just going to waste the wine and you're going to make my grave muddy. Don't you love that one? Now, this one appears so often, it's Latin, and you just abbreviate it. You just put N-F-N-N. -N -N. Now, even if you don't know Latin, I bet you can figure this one out. Let's read it. Non fui, fui, non sum, non curo. I was not, I was, I am not, I don't care. That one is widespread. So what is this guy saying? Non fui, I was not. I mean, are we really worried about what we were before our birth? I know some people are, but most people don't think about it. The question is always, what happens to me when I die? You know, very few people express the question as a kind of concern. What happened to me before I was born? I know some people believe in reincarnation and they would ask that. So non fui, fui, then you were, you existed. Well, now you're dead. So non sum, you are not. Now notice you, you don't exist. So what do you think about that? Non curo, I don't care. Uh, I suggested once to my students, just as a little game, I didn't really mean it, but you know how people write on chalk, they should go around and write N, F, N, N, and let people try to figure it out. Number four, I fled the miseries of sickness and the great ills of life. I am now delivered from all its pains and enjoy a peaceful calm. I think that's kind of like rest in peace. I don't think it's really some active afterlife. Weep not for what use is weeping, rather venerate me, for I am now a divine star which shows itself at sunset. That's a 20 year old to his mother, basically giving her that hope, uh, astral immortality. Now the rest of these are very common. You probably go to the local funerary epitaph shop and you see a whole range of things you can pick for your tomb. Happy voyage. May earth be light for you. Here rests. That's very simple. In eternal rest. May his bones rest in eternal sleep. This one implies maybe a trip. Wherever you're going, bon voyage. The rest of them seem to say at least now you're at peace. Just rest in peace. R.I.P. we say. So let's switch to a Jewish text. This is the wisdom book of the Apocrypha. I've got a Bible here. This has got the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, the New Testament and the Apocrypha, puts the Apocrypha in the back. 
it's good to have all of these because you get the whole range of ancient Near Eastern, later views like the book of Daniel we saw into the New Testament, but even before that, some of the Apocrypha books. So the wisdom of Solomon, as it's sometimes called, it dates to the first century BC. Uh, let's read this. It's about what's going to happen in the future. Death is the end versus resurrection in a new age. Short and sorrowful is our life, and there's no remedy when a man comes to his end, and no one has been known to return from Hades. Because we were born by mere chance, and hereafter we shall be as though we had never been, because our breath in our nostrils is smoke, and reason is a spark kindled by the beating of our hearts. When it is extinguished, the body will turn to ashes and the spirit will dissolve like empty air. Our name will be forgotten in time and no one will remember our works. Our life will pass away like the traces of a cloud and be scattered like mist that is chased by the rays of the sun and overcome by its heat. For our allotted time is a passing shadow and there is no return from death because it is sealed up and no one turns back. So that would be pretty much the no afterlife view. Well said, I think, uh, that let's say in this time the Epicureans would hold. Now, in the same book, notice the chapter. This is chapter two and this is chapter three. What the writer is really doing is setting you up. What he's saying in that reading I just read is that's what wicked people say. They think that. They think they never existed and then they're going to die and there'll be nothing. There's, they think there'll be no judgment. They think there's no afterlife. A very common view in the ancient world. But same author, but the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God. This is in contrast. The souls of the righteous are in the hand of God and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish, they seem to have died. Interesting phrase. Somebody dies or do they? They seem to have died. And their departure is thought of to be an affliction. You're sorry when somebody goes. And they're going from us to be their destruction. But they are at peace. For though in the sight of men they were punished, their hope is full of immortality. The idea of punished maybe not be the best translation, but maybe something like, you know, they had to go to the grave. Having been disciplined a little, they will receive great good because God tested them and found them worthy of himself. So life is a test. You know, you go through a lot of hardships, but you've got the hope of immortality. Like gold in the furnace, he tried them, and like a sacrificial burnt offering, he accepted them. In the time of their visitation, that's probably an eschatological idea at the end, or it could be individually when they die. In the time of their visitation, they will shine forth and will run like sparks through the stubble. They will govern nations and rule over peoples, and the Lord will reign over them forever. So I think that is hinting at a kind of a resurrection of the dead, but it doesn't seem like there's much concern for the physical body. They seem to have perished. Now, here's a text that seems out of place. I mean, why would I go from an Apocrypha book all the way back to the book of Isaiah? Because in these chapters of Isaiah 24 through 27, it's often called by scholars the Isaiah Apocalypse. It seems like these chapters have just been set into the ancient book of Isaiah. They are contained in the Dead Sea Scroll copy, so they certainly go back to first century BCE at least. But are they reflecting something later than, say, Isaiah's time, because we don't read about this anywhere else in the Hebrew Bible quite like this. It sounds like, and if you read 24, 25, 6, and 7, you'll see, sounds like something that would come much later, not Isaiah, something that would be very much cosmic, 
very much uh, having to do with the whole world being punished and a judgment of God and then a kind of new creation of some type. But this is what the scholars think. So let's read it. Verse 13. O Lord, our God, other lords besides you, I'm going to say you, have ruled over us, but your name alone we acknowledge. They are dead. They will not live. They are shades. They will not rise. To that end, you have visited them with destruction and wiped out all remembrance of them. So those particular verses take the view that the Gentile nations that have no faith in God and that have oppressed the people of Israel, when they die, they just die. So that's the old view. When you die, you die. You go to Sheol. That's it. But let's go on. Look at verse 15. But you've increased the nation, O Lord. That's Yahweh. You've increased the nation and you are glorified. You've enlarged the borders of the land. Well, that would just have to do with this world. But then if you go on down to verse 19, it seems to move toward a more eschatological time. But we have a translation problem. I think some of you had asked me about this in the comments to previous videos. Here's how the RSV translates it. Thy dead shall live, their bodies shall arise. Wow, that's amazing. Their bodies. O dwellers in the dust, awake and sing for joy. Remember, you sleep in the dust and now you wake up. It sounds like Daniel uh, 12. For thy dew, this is God's dew, is a dew of light. On the land of the shades, you will let it fall. So God's dew is light and it falls upon the world of the dead, the world of shades, Sheol, basically, and God's dead come forth. This is the earliest view that we can trace of a kind of a partial resurrection. Remember in the New Testament, the apostle Paul is on trial at one point, and he says, I believe in the resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Because one of the views that begins to emerge, and that's why he says, I believe both, is that some people would say, well, I believe in the resurrection of the just, but the unjust, they can just stay in Sheol. So here you have the idea that resurrection comes, but it's partial. Now, what's the problem with it? Thy dead shall live is okay, but their bodies, it doesn't actually say that. It says, my body shall rise. My body? Is it the writer? Uh, it's hard to say. Is it some angel? Is it God himself? Because it is a proclamation. But then it gets plural again. O oh, dwellers in the dust. So the RSV just decides that it's some sort of a maybe scribal era. Uh, and they translate it as plural all the way through. It's hard to know. This is a very, very difficult passage. If you've never read these, as I said, take a look at them. You'll think you're reading the book of Revelation or something. Now, here's another text. This is from the Maccabean period, 165 following BCE. And it's second Maccabee. So it's very, very legendary and very, uh, what should I say, extravagant and uh, elaborated with all kinds of uh, things that sound pretty far-fetched. But it's talking about the persecution of the Syrian king Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV, who did come into Jerusalem, defile the temple, and began to forbid the practice of Judaism. He wanted to have his whole empire worship Zeus, his ancestral god. So he sent his people out village by village. And here it's even him present. He goes out and they call everybody together, just like the Nazis did with the Jews to the town square. And then they announce, hear you, hear you. Uh, you're going to give up your Judaism. We're going to burn your Torah scrolls. You're, and in order to show that you're doing this, we're going to have you eat a little bit of pig flesh because we know you can't do that. Well, there's one family, it's seven brothers and their mother, and they absolutely refuse to do it. So they, I'll read it to you. 
it happened also that seven brothers and their mother were arrested and were being compelled by the king under torture with whips and cords to partake of unlawful swine's flesh. One of them acting as their spokesman said, what do you intend to ask and learn from us? For we are ready to die rather than transgress the laws of our fathers. Now, this is the first recorded case of what we could call martyrdom. Martyrdom is the idea of testifying. So here in this story, the brothers and their mother are testifying to their faith and willing to die for it. They won't give it up. So they're martyrs. I think, remember I talked previously about theodicy. How do you justify God in a world that is such a mixture of good and evil? So think about this case. Think about the moral dilemma. It's one thing to say that all of humanity goes to Hades, the good, the bad, and ugly, every class, every stage, or to Sheol, if you use the Hebrew term, and they just don't come back. They had their time on earth, a kind of a Gilgamesh idea, and also the view we saw in the Hebrew Bible, in the book of Ecclesiastes, especially. Eat, drink, and be merry, enjoy your life, don't worry about death. But if you died for the faith, you know, you could have eaten the swine flesh and lived, but you died for the faith. Doesn't God have to raise you or reward you some way? It's almost morally demanded of your belief system. Anyway, this gets very colorful. Hold on. The king fell into a rage. He just can't stand the stubbornness of these people. And he gave orders that pans and cauldrons be heated. And they were heated immediately. And he commanded that the tongue of their spokesman be cut out. And they scalped him and cut off his hands and feet while the rest of the brothers and the mother looked on. And when he was utterly helpless, the king ordered them to take him to the fire, still breathing, and to fry him in a pan. Oh, God, I could hardly picture this. This is just pretty sick. The smoke from the pan spread widely, but the brothers and their mother encouraged one another to die nobly, saying, the Lord God is watching over us and in truth has compassion on us, as Moses declared in his song, which bore witness against the people to their faces when he said, quote, and he will have compassion on his servants. Okay, it goes on. Verse 10. After him, the third was the victim of their sport. And when it was demanded, he quickly put out his tongue and courageously stretched forth his hands. And he said nobly, I got these from heaven because of his laws. I disdain them. They're nothing to me. If your right hand offends you, cut it off. So he says, I, I don't care about my hands because I got them from God and from him, I hope to get them back again. As a result, the king himself and those who were with him were astonished at the young man's spirit, for he regarded his sufferings as nothing. Very typical martyr stories. We get so many later with the early Christians. And then finally, here's what I wanted you to really notice, not just the gruesome torture. And when he too had died, they maltreated and tortured the fourth in the same way. And if you get Second Maccabees, you can read all seven and the mother. And when he was near death, he said, now notice, this is what I want you to notice. I'll just highlight it where everybody wakes up. One cannot but choose to die at the hands of men and to cherish the hope that God gives of being raised again by him. But for you, there will be no resurrection to life. Interesting. So you see, there is the idea that you're never coming back. You're going to Hades. You're going to Sheol. And in some Greek views, there's even the idea that you'll be punished there. But here, the resurrection idea is very bodily. You know, I'm going to give you my tongue. I'm going to give you my hands, but I'll get them back in the resurrection. Definitely a kind of bodily resurrection. Now, in Greek culture, you wouldn't worry about the body. Uh, you would just say, well, I'm leaving the body. The body is a prison. The body is just a shell. It's not really me. And my soul goes to heaven. 
So we're getting the idea that it's important for the dead to be raised, but here it's a literal physical resurrection. When we get to the New Testament, one of the big things I'm going to discuss is whether the earliest followers of Jesus believed he was raised in a physical body or in a spiritual body. Notice I didn't say raised physically or spiritually, because they always say there's a body, but as Paul says, what kind of a body did they believe in? So that, hold on for that. That'll be a while. Now, here is a Dead Sea Scroll fragment, 4Q521. I published this. I was the first with Michael Wise to publish it. And it was part of those unpublished Dead Sea Scrolls in the 90s. You On my YouTube channel, I put a video up that captures the moment in the 90s when we were publishing these scrolls and talking about them. Some of you might have seen that. Anyway, this one was really important. You can see it here. If you read Hebrew and can zoom in, uh, you can actually read part of this right here, Mashiko. This is uh, the heavens and the earth will obey. That is, it's it's the word Shema, uh, will obey the, his Messiah, his Messiah. So the heavens and the earth will Listen to his Messiah, and Shema can mean obey, like Shema Yisrael, Hero Israel. And none therein will stray from the commandments of the Holy Ones. I'm not giving you the complete text, but look what it says. And the Lord will accomplish glorious things which have never been. And he, and we think this is the Messiah, will heal the wounded, revive the dead, and preach good or bring good news to the poor. Uh, when I published that, I realized, and it's pointed out in the article in Bar Magazine and then the Journal of Pseudepigrapha, edited by James Charlesworth, we pointed out that that is uncannily like the New Testament in the Q source or the two sources, Luke and Matthew, that they have in common. Chapter 7 of Luke, where John the Baptist sends a message to Jesus through his followers, and says, are you the one or should we look for another? And Jesus sends a message back saying something very close to this uh, Dead Sea Scroll, that the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, and so forth. The captives are set free, and the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached. I would not say that he's quoting the scroll, but it shows that when this scroll was written, there was a similar messianic expectation about what the heavenly Messiah would do. And notice, the heavens and the earth will listen to him. So he's been exalted to heaven, and uh, it's a very important text. By the way, I'm filming a course right now with Derek Lambert of Myth Vision Podcast. That's why I'm here in his studio. And it's on Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I'll just work it in here as a quick announcement. And this is one of the texts that we talk about. So when that comes out in a few weeks, I hope, uh, maybe many of you will watch for that. Now, Jesus enters the debate in the Gospels in Luke 20 because the Sadducees are holding the old view, remember, in the wisdom of Solomon, Short and happy is our life, but full of troubles, and we die, and it's like smoke, and there's nothing. They're holding that old view that when you die, you go to Sheol. So they say there's no resurrection. Teacher Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies having a wife but no children, the man must take the wife and raise up children for his brother. Now, this view of the Sadducees is also in the Apocrypha. So the wisdom of Solomon that we saw is beginning to give hope of resurrection or at least eternal life. But if you look at Ben Sirach, it has the old Sadducean view. So one reason to get the Apocrypha is you can read one book and the other. They're both about the first century BCE. You can actually see the arguments and ideas of these two competing views. I would really recommend that. So anyway, this is a little kind of hypothetical question, as we say, 
uh, in Jewish law, if a brother dies without children and has a brother that can marry the widow, he should and raise children for his brother. So they go, well, suppose there were seven brothers and the first took a wife and died and the second and the third and likewise the seventh. No children ever. Afterward, the woman also died. So everybody's dead now. Seven husbands and one wife and no kids. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as wife. So they expect to really stump him with that. But since he believes in resurrection of the dead, it isn't a problem. But here he seems to say it is not that old body coming back. I think he's agreeing with the Apostle Paul. We're going to really get into that later. It is a body, and they do come back. It's not just the immortal soul. They come forth from the dead. Notice they're raised from the dead, as you'll see. And it's a privilege. They're worthy to attain that, to be given eternal life. You've still got one foot back in Genesis. You are dust, Adam and Eve, and to dust you will return. But you could be raised. And if you're raised, how are you raised? Here's what he says. The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are accounted worthy to attain that age and to the resurrection of the dead. Doesn't sound like we're just resuscitating a corpse here. This is the new age, the new creation, and you have to be counted worthy to participate in what's called the resurrection of the just. Okay, so those worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection of the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, as it's not like normal human life today, for they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. They become divine beings, basically. Doesn't mean they're God, the creator, the father, as he's spoken of. But they're gods, and according to Paul, they're even above angels. Jesus being the firstborn of many, according to Paul. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush. Remember the burning bush? Where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. In other words, when Moses hears God in the burning bush, he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Nice little Jewish exegetical point. This kind of argument is very, very common in Jewish literature and in the rabbinic texts. He didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they still live. So even though you die, it is not annihilation. It is not non-existence. You exist, but you exist in the world of the dead. And resurrection means you can come forth from that world of the dead. So what we begin to get uh, at the turn of the century and into the time of Jesus is two kinds of burial. One is urns. These are funerary urns from a Roman villa. Actually, this I took this in Germany on the Rhine River. Uh, they've been dug up there at uh, a Roman camp. They're very beautiful. This would be somewhat wealthy. And you put the ashes in the urn. And ossuaries. Ossuaries are bone boxes where you save the bones and write the name or names of individuals on the side. This is more the idea that the soul has gone. You'll never need the body. You're not going to put ashes back together. This is the idea, at least symbolizing it. Can these bones live? Yes, the bones are going to come forth. So ossuaries are a first sign in the Herodian period in the time of Jesus, first century BC, first century CE, of this individualization of the dead. They're going to come back. They're going to come out of the tombs. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, all who are in the graves will come forth. Now, I don't think he's looking for the zombie apocalypse, but they'll come forth in this new glorified state. So 
We're going to go further, but uh, you see how we're moving into the first century, and we'll look at Christian, Jewish, and Greco-Roman views as we move along. We'll continue. Hope you learned a lot and benefited from this. Take care, everybody. Goodbye.